and the presentations will be shared there as well. Please enter any comments you have in the Q&A or the chat box. Anne will keep notes and forward the questions to me so we can address them during the panel discussion. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce our opening presenter, Anya Waite. Anya is the Scientific Director and CEO of the Ocean Frontiers Institute and Associate Vice President of Research at Dalhousie University. Anya, please, over to you. Thank you very much, Jessica, and hello, everyone. Um, this is the second information session for co-designing integrated ocean observing and prediction capabilities. And it's a very exciting program, which is really at the heart of GOOSE. Um, and GOOSE, as you can see in the upper left-hand corner, is at the heart of the ocean decade. Uh, next slide, please. So as you may know, um, ocean observations are integrated through GOOSE across 86 countries almost 9,000 in situ observing platforms and 170 satellites. The focus has been on climate and operational services and increasing ocean health and human impacts have been something that we're more and more interested in including. We also include 12 major global ocean observing networks. You can see them all here in many colors. Um, and if you make the dots big enough, they cover the whole ocean. But I think that's important. What is important to remember is that each one of those dots is one piece of technology and they are quite small. And we need to make sure that this whole ocean is well observed, which is what we're trying to, um, what we're trying to get to with this program. Next slide, please. Application areas in need include Climate, we know that um, ocean data is absolutely critical for climate observation. That's becoming more and more obvious as we work with our meteorological colleagues through the WMO. Um, mitigation and ad adaptation and seasonal forecasts are really important and impossible without ocean data. Ocean data also support operational services and uh, the marine economy, risk reduction through, for example, the insurance industry, they all depend entirely on ocean data to make sure that their predictions have validity. We're also interested in ocean prediction for ocean health and the sustainability of ocean ecosystem services, many of which are currently at risk. Next slide, please. So if we look through the whole spectrum from observations to data management to analysis or linking that data up through models and then to applications. Ocean observation underpin a very, very wide range of ap applications. And we have the need for an expansion of the global ocean observing system that's designed to meet the requirements of a broad suite of users. And this need is becoming more clear and more urgent. Next slide, please. So the vision for Goose is a truly global ocean observing system that delivers the essential information needed for our sustainable development, safety, well-being, and prosperity. And our mission is to lead the ocean observing community to create partnerships to grow an integrated, responsive, and sustained observing system. And of course, that is easier said than done. This is really corralling a network of networks, bringing people together to agree on issues and to act together so that together we're more than the sum of the parts. And in the past, I think that's sometimes happened and sometimes not happened. And the key aim at Goose is to improve our functioning so that we move forward together. And if you look down on the bottom right there, you'll see a picture of our, the Global Ocean Observing System 2030 strategy that's available on our website. Um, and you can see that the three key areas there are deepening this engagement and impact so that we can really empower end users integration and delivery of the actual system itself, particularly focusing on data and implementation and building for the future. Next slide, please. The UN Decade of Ocean Science really is an opportunity for us all. And the vision of the Ocean Decade is the science we need for the ocean we want. And its mission is to catalyze transformative ocean science solutions for sustainable development, connecting people and our ocean. The most pressing need for us all, however, is to collectively find the transformative solutions to the existing and future challenges that face the ocean and thus humankind. 
Next slide, please. A predicted ocean. Again, a simple concept, but, but in practice, very complicated. It's an, a predicted ocean is where society understands and can respond to changing ocean conditions. And we already know that this in itself is a major challenge. We know that, for example, policymakers are not always aware of the critical role the ocean plays, for example, in absorbing anthropogenic carbon and anthropogenic heat, just to name a couple of important issues. Next slide, please. The Ocean Decade Endorsed Programs are integrated under Goose. And you can see this sort of picture here, which shows you the three big programs, Ocean Observing Co-Design, Coast Predict, and Observing Together. And in the center there, you see Goose integration, which is really the function of pulling this together, knitting it together into one coherent conversation. Just briefly, Ocean Observing Co-Design will create a system co-designed with the observing, modeling, and key user stakeholders. And these are led by Sabrina Spike, David Legler, and Emma Heslop. Coast Predict will redefine the science of observing and predicting <clears throat> the global coastal ocean, co-designing needed infrastructure, and often offering open and free in access to coastal information. And this was led primarily by Nadia Pignardi with Vili Kurafalo and Joachim Tintore. Observing Together is a, uh, a program which will transform ocean data access and availability by connecting ocean observers and the communities they serve. Next slide, please. If we look at the 4C, this is ocean prediction capacity of the future. The 4C program led by Ocean Predict aims to strengthen an international community approach. And it's an approach that advances ocean prediction science in collaboration with observation groups and others, increases this integration, the capacity, efficacy, use, and impacts of the ocean prediction system, and co-creates an effective and sustainable collaborative operational oceanography ecosystem environment with really what they're calling democratized access to output. And that means everybody can access ocean data and responsive to user needs that's a communication issue, getting the communication to the community that uses the data and then pulling it back. And this is this group is going to be working jointly with other decade programs across the value, value chain. You can see on the right a kind of diagram of how they envisage um, the program working. Next slide, please. So together, we believe these programs will really enhance collaboration across Goose and consideration of, and really bring us to consideration of user needs that will lead to increased knowledge and understanding of the ocean and result in sustainable solutions. The idea is to develop a user-focused co-design process. That means people working together, bringing their values and their knowledge together to create a more integrated and responsive ocean observing system. So co-design means an overall framework that in includes standards and best practices for the full observation and prediction value chain. Lastly, it needs to enhance the prediction system science and make sure that it has societal impact. Next slide, please. So if we step back and think about this, the benefits that should be accruing to society from these activities are really to empower society to adapt to, for example, climate change, um, to develop new multi-platform observing and modeling technologies, to manage ocean resources, to predict and warn more skillfully, and we need reliable predictions of different potential futures. In the end, this means that we need more effective decision-making and this entire process should inform that to improve delivery of knowledge, products, and services to a range of stakeholders. And of course, this is a hugely ambitious goal. We have a decade under the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And the idea is that we plan this decade so that these lofty goals can actually be achieved. Next slide, please. And with that, I would just like to thank particularly Anne Christine and the whole group um, who have done an amazing job setting up this first discussion. Um, it's been really nice to work with you and I'm looking forward to the discussion today. 
Well, Anya, thank you so much for setting up um, so nicely for the rest of our, our presentations and eventually the panel conversation. So thank you for that wonderful overview. And from here, we're going to move to a series of four keynote presentations, which were previously recorded and learn in more detail um, the, the pieces that uh, Anya just described. Our first keynote is on ocean observing co-design. This will be presented by Emma Heslop and Sabrina Spike. Emma is a project specialist with IOC UNESCO at the Global Ocean Observing System Program. Sabrina is a professor in ocean, atmosphere, and climate sciences at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. Right, well, um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, perhaps depending on which part of the world you're tuning in from. My name is Emma Heslop, and I work for IOC UNESCO, supporting the Global Ocean Observing System, GOOS. And here with my colleague, Sabrina Speech, we're going to be talking about the Ocean Observing Co-Design Program, one of the three GOOS Ocean Decade programs that have recently been endorsed by the, the Ocean Decade Office. Um, Sabrina, along with David Legler, are the co-chairs of this program, and Albert Fisher and Anne-Christine Zinken have also been very much involved in, in the core work. So what, what, what does this program do in terms of supporting the decade? What, what are we looking to transform? So Ocean Observing Co-Design is about transforming our Ocean Observing System assessment and design process, and we're going to take you through the ideas behind that. So I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted here, but we need uh, a lot of new information from the ocean and on the ocean to meet some of our major challenges that society faces across climate change, adaptation and mitigation. We need better prediction in the coastal ocean <clears throat> and for weather, uh, for uh, things like extremes, but also in the coastal ocean for food security and for human safety, and finally, the, the well-being of marine life. And for all of this, we need to better integrate our observations and models to produce more useful knowledge and to establish clear priorities for the investment in the ocean observing for the future. We can't observe everywhere all the time, so we need the information to be able to make the best choices. So ocean observing co-design will support strongly the ocean decade in this area by transforming our ocean observing system assessment and design process. We aim to develop a more user-focused co-design process to create a fit-for-purpose integrated and responsive system, including the large range of current ocean observing efforts and those that are in plan, as well as actively involving new technologies and, of, as I said, getting together with the modelling, forecast and services communities around the process of co-design and together build this process, the infrastructure, the tools to better inform uh, investment and benefit society. So we have five objectives. Uh, I won't read through the whole of these objectives as they're quite long. So um, the, the aims, the top aims are really to offer the, the national government funders and, and other funders the information needed to target investment globally, regionally, and even locally, to provide these investors with the opportunity to create a hub or a center of excellence around, around this new capability to make ocean observing and information appreciably more accessible and impactful through this transformative co-design process, working with the modeling community and key user stakeholders. We aim to develop system diagnostics, tools and reporting capability so that we can better assess fitness for purpose across evolving requirements and also establish the international capacity and modular infrastructure to co-design and regularly evaluate the observing system. Now core to this concept, which is what we'll have a look at in a minute, are the use area exemplars. These are use areas of, of users with a, with a defined use that they want to put these observations and um, model outputs to. So it could be, for example, an extreme event forecasting around carbon budgets for governments or, or even the reinsurance industry. So this is to kind of dive into that exemplar area a little further. So you may be familiar with the FOO, which is on the right hand side of this, um, this slide. And in the, in the red circle is, is the kind of the, the feedback mechanism that was um, seen to exist between uh, the users and the, the, the services and, and the, the requirements. This is really where we're focusing. We really want to strengthen and transform this, this whole area. 
and that will indeed start with looking at the, the user needs and requirements around use area exemplars and using this to kind of drive co-design, looking at whether there's products and services in place, uh, working with the observations community around what exists and what's in plan, and then working to produce answers around where that we would gain the most value with the models and assessment tools, really aiming through these processes to create an integrated and more impactful observing system with models and, and products. So, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Sabrina now, who's going to kind of uh, expand a little bit on the exemplar areas. Sabrina, all yours. Yeah, so the strategy between the exemplars lying in taking concrete user cases to assemble community forces and pragmatically build an integrative effort towards our goal. So here are some examples we are discussing with partners and uh, other uh, or decade programs. So for example, uh, the carbon uh, cycling is um, uh, really uh, uh, have direct economic relevance to blue bonds and carbon trading, providing vital information to governments needed to conduct the uh, COP processes. Uh, we can also focus in some extreme events, for example, uh, continental heatwaves that have really a strong uh, impact on society, and it is really of interest of national uh, weather services. We can uh, uh, work on coastal storm surge inundations that have a, a imp impact again, a strong impact uh, on our society, and we'll be working uh, towards uh, a better uh, coastal managing, management, urban planning, and uh, risk reductions. Uh, we have also uh, marine heat waves that uh, impact um, food av availability and, uh, and security. So it is really important for uh, aquacultures and fisheries. We work also together with um, uh, GECOS and GOOS, and we need to report to UNFCCC, so in all variable and assessment about uh, uh, climate cycle, in which, for example, the climate ocean heat content uh, uh, takes uh, really a key role. So uh, with these exemplars, uh, we are building the partnership uh, concretely between the three programs in order to uh, for them uh, to exist uh, for real. So what we will be delivering to society uh, uh, during this ocean decade uh, through this partnership, we will uh, really uh, make uh, goods more mature to benefit society. We will develop uh, tools that will allow our stakeholders, uh, sponsors and users to ask key questions about uh, the cost and also the benefit that uh, uh, that uh, is a, uh, that comes from an ocean observing and receive a quantitative answer. We will be able, of, for example, to better track the current state and future variability of the ocean. We will uh, improve the prediction skills and more uh, better society about uh, extreme events or the changing climate impact. We will uh, better manage uh, ocean resources. We empower society to uh, concretely adapt to uh, the, uh, the rapidly changing climate. And we will assess the impact of action toward a sustainable ocean. So how we will be contributing to a predicted ocean. So the observing system will be integrated, integrated and will be, uh, this integration will be guided by user or users, in any case, uh, uh, building through these exemplars. Process and tools uh, will uh, better align to the, predict uh, to the prediction systems uh, across the different services uh, and uh, the observation uh, will be fit for purpose they rely on. Enhanced ocean knowledge powered by connected observations, model, and products. The ocean decade, ocean observing, uh, is a, an opportunity, but also a challenge because uh, we need to install a dialogue uh, through different uh, uh, partners that are uh, essentially programs and the community of uh, ocean observing and modeling. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, working through these uh, user cases will enable this dialogue 
to go become concrete and to build a, a stronger partnership. So the coordination will uh, uh, will be based really on, on this um, integrative effort toward these practical cases. So uh, this uh, this ocean observing co-design has uh, already built a stronger. Uh, partnership through an advisory group and co-design partners that goes across uh, international organizations that um, that uh, works uh, in science or services to society and we are uh, really looking uh, to uh, build uh, with all the observing and modeling communities and services as, as a larger and stronger partnership that we hope will come through concrete uh, project to the ocean decade so we thank you very much for you listening to our um, to our uh, ocean observing design descriptions and you will be finding more uh, information on the goose ocean uh, web page thank you very much with that we will move on to our second keynote presentation this is on coast predict and will be delivered by Nadia Pinardi, who is a professor of oceanography at Alma Mater Studorium University of Bologna, Italy, Vili Karafalu, a professor of ocean sciences at the University of Miami and co-chair of the Coast Predict program, Joaquin Tintore, a physical oceanographer at the Balearic Islands Coastal Ocean Observing and Forecasting System, and Emma Heslop, who we just heard from with the Global Ocean Observing System program. and good morning everybody. This is a short presentation to explain the main goals and expected outputs of the endorsed decade program Coast Predict, observing and predicting the global coastal ocean. The program has been constructed by a community of international research organizations and individual scientists, satellite agencies, governmental and UN agencies. The main idea is to start a process of transformative science for the global coastal ocean, revolutionizing observing and forecasting in the coastal areas, co-designing the international infrastructure needed to offer free access to coastal information. The basic concept of the global coastal ocean was proposed uh, in the five volumes of the historical series, The Sea. Coast Predict will redefine the coastal ocean. And here is a starting definition. The coastal zone is that area extending inshore from the estuary mouth to river catchments affected by salt waters, including the urban settlements on the one side and extending on the other side to the offshore from the surf zone to the continental shelf and slope, and slope waters, where waters of continental origins meet open ocean currents. In the past 20 years, operational oceanography has developed information up to the kilometer scale in the global ocean and regional seas. Now we need to reach where people live, where climate change impacts are affecting people's activities, arriving at the few tens of meter resolution. We have prototypes and we need to standardize them, test them in many coastal areas of the planet. What a wonderful opportunity to do it in the decade. The high level objectives of Coast Predict are then a predicted global coastal ocean, the upgrade of to a fit for purpose oceanographic information infrastructure, co design and implementation of an integrated coastal ocean observing and forecasting system adhering to best practices and standards designed as a global framework and implemented locally. Uh, it is now time for my colleague Joaquin to continue. So I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you. Coast Predict is a co-designed transformative response to science and society needs, focusing on the many common worldwide features of the coastal ocean. 
the implementation plan accordingly has been framed around six focus areas corresponding to major outcomes and challenges of the decade and covering around 10 different coastal ocean areas of the planet. Each of the six focus areas will define the detailed scientific and strategic plan for maximum two core projects per area. Coast Predict will actually revolutionize global coastal ocean observation and forecasting, offering open access and free access to coastal information. Accordingly, the Coast Predict new integrated ocean observing approach will focus on integrated multidisciplinary and multi-platform ocean observation that will guarantee free quality control and open data are received, pre-processed and made available for scientists and society. By this improving and extending the predictive capabilities in the coastal zone and the response to end users needs, by this again, reinforcing the value chain of ocean observation and forecasting. And now I ask Billy, please to continue. Thanks very much. Coast Predict is engaging in transformative science in support of predictions that bring the ocean effects all the way to the coast and even the urban coastal areas where people live. This is a schematic of what we call the urban ocean that connects the marine influences with the terrestrial influences and the predictions of natural phenomena, as for instance, coastal hazards with the impacts of socioeconomics, even building code needs, engaged in architecture and engineering, as well as impacts on coastal ocean and human health. This is an example of prediction of coastal storm surge inundation that integrates advanced research and storm surge prediction with geographic information science, coastal vulnerability, and visual risk communication. The Coast Predict main decade outcomes are integrated knowledge of the global coastal ocean from events to climate, under our goal to advance knowledge, the design and implementation of an integrated river, estuary, coastal ocean, open ocean, ocean observing and modeling multidisciplinary system towards integrating, observing, and predicting, improved coastal marine forecasting and extended range predictive capabilities toward accurate predictions from hours to decades ahead, the development of methods for trusted data information exchange and the interoperability through the entire value chain and their adaptation as best practices toward open and free access to coastal information, innovative and sustainable applications for coastal solutions and services that directly benefit coastal populations, including well-being and human health. This is our solutions component. Increased equitable education capacity for observing and forecasting the global coastal ocean. This is our capacity building component and strong engagement of early career ocean professionals and promotion of education training under principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is our education component to make sure that no one is left behind. And now I invite my colleague Emma to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. So well, the, the, the challenges put on the table by the ocean decade uh, are large, not just within the observing and forecasting community, but also in terms of the coordination um, amongst the observing and the forecasting community. But this will be vital for the greatest level of impact and, and also the greatest level of efficiency. So GUS, in responding to the decade, put forward three key and, and large programs, um, and these are um, connected through the theme of integration, um, ocean observing co-design, Coast Predict, which we're talking about uh, in this presentation, and observing together, and each of them focus on uh, a different aspect um, of meeting the decade challenges. Coast Predict into the coast, Ocean observing co-design, as it implies, really creating a, a new co-design system and observing together, really enabling local and smaller communities to all uh, profit from observations. And as you can see from this diagram, it uh, was envisaged from um, early on that there would need to be close cooperation between these programs and, and many of the other programs. And there will be a particularly tight cooperation between Coast Predict, Ocean Observing, Co-Design and 4 c um, And, you know, how, how is this going to happen? I, I, th I think I see two, two major ways. One is through dialogue and alignment. And then second, through having co-projects that we will use 
to, to sort of formulate these, these strong connections between the programs. And you could envisage very early on a connection around the, the, the co-design of, of aspects of the, the, the Coast Predict program, um, also connecting into the, to the 4C solution. So I think as you know, we, we talk a little bit further, we'll see these projects really coming to life that help underpin um, the, the, well, the co-design cooperation between these uh, three entities. So I'm going to hand over to Nadia for the final word. Thank you, Emma, Vili and Joachim uh, for, you know, growing together this community. Um, but not only we were supported, but we were uh, continuously fed by ideas from 80 uh, different institutions around the world, 20 advisory bodies, 20 ACOPs that helped in the past year to build uh, the strategic plan and only the initial strategic plan. You have an email here to contact us and please get in touch and get involved. Thank you. Just a reminder before we go into our next presentation, if you have questions or comments to share, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box or the chat. And uh, after these next two keynotes, we will pose those to our panel. So our next presentation is 4C. This will be delivered by Professor Bin Vinyasha, Vinyashandran from the Center for Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. Hello to everyone, and a very warm welcome to this short presentation on 4C. Ocean prediction is an essential component in the provision of dissemination of ocean information and Ocean Predict is a science program for the coordination and improvement of ocean forecasting systems. Ocean Predict provides a platform for communication and knowledge exchange. Ocean Predict is run by scientists and experts in operational oceanography from around the world. And the goal of Ocean Predict is to accelerate, strengthen and increase the impact of ocean prediction. 4C, the ocean prediction capacity of the future, is a UN Decade of Ocean Science program that contributes to the decade goal of a predictable ocean where society has the capacity to understand current and future ocean conditions. The vision of 4C is for strong international coordination and community building of an ocean prediction capacity for the future. There are two overarching goals. The first is to improve the science, capacity, efficacy, use and impact of ocean prediction systems. And the second is to co-build a seamless ocean information value chain right from observations all the way to end users for economic and societal benefit. These transformative goals aim to make ocean prediction science more impactful and relevant. In order to extend the vision and transform the capacity of ocean prediction, we have certain high-level objectives. These are listed here. The first is to coordinate ocean prediction worldwide in a suitable manner towards maximum societal benefits. The second is to maximize the benefits of ocean observations for ocean predictions and societal impact. The third is to support development and maturation of the full length operational oceanography value chain from observations to the end users by using best practices and coordinating the integration of existing and new partners such as international science initiatives and intergovernmental inter organizations. The fourth is to advance the science behind ocean prediction and its connection to the other components of the Earth system, which includes atmosphere, land, 
cryosphere continental hydrology etc finally make ocean prediction science more impactful and relevant by collaborating with the socio economic experts and stakeholders to quantify the impact and utility of ocean prediction for science and society especially in coastal areas uh, particularly in collaboration with uh, a coast predict which is another un decade program now uh, how is this different from the business as usual scenario of ocean predict ocean predict has a coordination mechanism that runs across national ocean prediction centers for information exchange required for improving ocean prediction however the impact and relevance of advances in ocean prediction towards societal benefits are not well quantified nor evaluated or communicated on the other hand the vision of forc includes strong international community building of the ocean prediction of the future that not only advances prediction science but also increases capacity efficacy use and impacts of the ocean prediction systems it is envisaged that this would lead to an effective and sustainable operational oceanography ecosystem environment which is responsive to user needs what is envisioned it's envisioned that forsee would transform the ocean prediction so as to penetrate the layers that have not been accessed until now towards this forsee will co-create a framework for operational oceanography enabling scientists to engage and collaborate with all components of the value chain as well as the un decade programs associated with these components this would enable the creation of an effective and sustainable operational oceanography ecosystem environment which is responsive to user needs more importantly foresee will enhance communication of the impact and relevance of ocean prediction outcome from foresee is expected to improve the interaction between the ocean environment and society particularly in the areas of human health and health of the environment having a good understand of understanding of the oceans and their interaction with the human health will be important in any future human health disasters the improved integration of observations and models which would happen during foresee would allow science policy and civil organizations to understand the ocean's role in health impacts especially under a changing climate accordingly the emphasis of forci will be on making the ocean predictions and reanalysis easily accessible to community at large via a central repository in order to approach the ocean the solution forci would focus on two major themes the first theme is catalyzing transformation transformative ocean prediction science solutions for sustainable development connecting people and ocean prediction and the second theme is increasing impact and relevance improving science and science capacity for the ocean we want realization of these themes would take place through projects that take up the challenging task of scientific development demanded by impactful and relevant ocean predictions these efforts are designed to contribute to contribute towards the bigger un goal of transforming from the ocean we have to the ocean we want the theme one would generate mechanisms for ocean prediction science and marine environmental prediction services for blue economy theme two would advance the science needed to evaluate its impact on prediction systems enabling focus on and enhancement of relevant capabilities and efforts connection and exchange with other bodies is absolutely essential to achieve these large goals democratizing ocean information to enable more impactful engagement is not an easy task to be achieved alone but together with other forums of similar interest 
Forsee will collaborate with and leverage data, data access platform programs to provide inclusive accessibility ease to ocean observations, ocean prediction inputs, and ocean system information. This would be done in an equitable manner, enabling everyone to access and benefit from ocean information. In addition, Forsi would engage with the diverse stakeholders in the core design processes via existing or emerging partnerships with programs such as UNEP, GeoBlue Planet, WMO, IOC, and GOOSE, and also with other DGATE programs such as uh, Cost Predict and Marine Life 2030. Larger participation from the scientific community will be solicited, solicited via projects that are relevant to uh, the goals. Additionally, 4C connects with several UN DGATE projects. These are uh, the observing system co-designed by GOOSE for designing and implementation of observing networks interface with open ocean systems and cost predict for global ocean analysis and forecast to the cost ocean. These two programs, OPSCODE and cost predict, also collaborate with Synox, which is also closely linked to uh, uh, 4C. Ditto for advanced digital framework on which all marine data modeling and simulation outputs will be shared so that it can be accessed, manipulated, analyzed, and visualized for marine information. GEOS, Global Ecosystem for Ocean Solutions for New Scientific Knowledge, and uh, together with 4C technology prototypes to advance solutions and involve stakeholder communities. Ocean Science Fund for All for synergy with 4C to co-finance and co-implement projects that build the capacity of under-resourced regions to monitor, understand, and predict their cost to ocean. Ocean Corps for sustained long-term education and such collaborations between scientists beyond all boundaries. During the implementation of 4C, one major activity and contribution would be capacity development by developing special programs for the involvement of early career ocean professionals. The email contact point for 4C is 4C2020 at gmail.com and the web page is oceanpredict.org. Thank you very much for your attention. That brings us to our fourth keynote presentation. It's titled Sin Obs, and this will be presented by Yosuke Fuji, who is a senior researcher at the Meteorological Research Institute, Japan Meteorological Agency. Hello, everyone. I'm Yosuke Fuji, working at the Meteorological Research Institute, Japan Meteorological Agency. I'm co chairing Ocean Predict Observing System Evaluation Task Team. We are now proposing synergistic observing network for impactful and relevant ocean predictions, or SINNOBS, as an UNDK project. In this presentation, I will introduce what we are and what we will try in SINNOBS. You know, SINNOBS is suggested as a common comprehensive project among the three UNDK programs, 4C, Cost Predict, and Ocean Observing Co-Design. You know, 4C is proposed by Ocean Predict in order to enhance the ocean prediction value chain. Cost Predict is also proposed to promote use of coastal prediction for societal benefits. These programs need to collaborate with observational committee to construct the observing system which are effective for predictions. Meanwhile, Ocean Observing Co-Design is proposed by GOOS to make the ocean observing network optimal for various purposes. So, Synops is proposed as a UNDK project under the collaboration of Ocean Predict task teams in order to generate transformative collaboration among the three UNDK programs. So, the objective of Synops is to seek the way to extract maximum benefits from the combination among various observation platforms, typically between satellite and instant observation data, or between coastal and open ocean platform in ocean and coastal predictions. 
on the strategy, Synonyms aimed to identify the optimal combination of different ocean observation platforms through observing still design or evaluation and to develop assimilation methods with which we can draw synergistic effects from the combination. And our targets include open ocean, such as global ocean, tropical ocean, mid latitude, and polar areas, and coastal and biogeochemical observing systems. Our expected activity of Synops is evaluating the existing ocean observing network. For example, this figure shows the impact of Tautolite Array and Algo Flows on the ENSO forecast, which were provided at the 2040 Tropical Pacific Observing System Workshop held after the crisis of the Tau Array. We will continue this kind of activities, that is, we aim to evaluate the ocean observing network using ocean prediction systems to support their sustainment and further development. And it should be noted that evaluation results will be severely system dependent as illustrated by this figure. This figure shows that the impact of Tautoriton is very different among different systems. So it is necessary to perform evaluation with multiple systems to get the robust and reliable conclusion. Therefore, community collaboration is very important. We also aim to support new observation. Synops will support designing new observing system through observation system simulation experiment, OSSE, or some other methods. For example, this figure shows clear reduction of errors when data of two source altimeter satellites are assimilated. We will support new satellite missions or constructing new instant observing systems through this kind of activities. We will also promote development of data assimilation scheme to assimilate new observations, as well as development to get more benefits from existing observations. Then we will summarize and provide information we get through operational activities or evaluation efforts using ocean prediction systems. This is a table on usage of observations in the ocean prediction systems we are currently presented on the web page. Thus, Synops will summarize information on the observation data, such as usage, QC, and impacts, which we get through ocean predictions. Those information will be provided to observation committee to support the management of ocean observing systems. Meanwhile, so far we tend to focus on a specific observing system, but to the transformative change on ocean predictions in this decade, we need to maximize benefits from the four ocean observing networks. Therefore, we decided that Synops will focus on synergies among different observing systems. So we will focus on the synergy from the following combinations of observing systems. First, satellite altimeters, satellite ocean current observation, and algo flows, mainly for ocean predictions. Second, satellite SST observation, near surface east observations, and sea surface atmospheric parameters, mainly for couple data simulation. Third, satellite ocean color observation and east observations for biogeochemical predictions. Fourth, observation of sea ice concentrations and sea ice thickness for polar predictions. And fifth, coastal ocean radars and sensors, gliders, drones, satellite remote sensing, and algal flows for coastal predictions. Then, Synops will bring benefit to the society. You know, Synops provide a straightforward reason for sustaining the ocean observing network. Then, it also makes guidelines toward a synergistic ocean observing network for a predicted ocean. And thus, suggests effective investment for the ocean observing system. It will also support improved ocean and coastal prediction capacity which will make benefits to marine disaster prevention, marine economy promotion, marine ecosystem management, climate prediction, and so on. So, Synops will surely contribute to a predicted ocean. 
Synops will evaluate the ocean observing network to sustain it as an indispensable infrastructure for a predicted ocean. Synops will design ocean observing systems to improve ocean and coastal prediction capacities. Synops will promote development for effective use of observation data in ocean coastal prediction. Through these activities, Synops will contribute for sea and coast predict and a predict ocean. Of course, Synops will contribute to ocean observing co-design. Synops will provide information on importance or necessity and effective designs of the ocean observing network for ocean and coastal predictions. It will also make input to the authorized report on future evolution of the ocean observing network from the perspective of ocean and coastal prediction. Thus, Synops aims to construct a positive feedback cycle between the observing network and ocean prediction systems. Then, how can you get involved in Synops? You know, Synops will have on-site and online meetings. A symposium is planned in November 2022, Tsukuba, Japan. We also have online meetings every two to three months. So, it would be nice if many people attend those meetings and share the results and join the collaborative works for future evolution of the ocean observing network. You know, collaboration among observational and model and data simulation community is indispensable for successful evaluation, design, and development. In addition, results using different prediction systems are necessary to get robust and reliable conclusions. So we will really welcome participation of young career scientists and various kinds of people. So see the web page or mail to the contact addresses to join our activities. These are information on the contact and the web page of Synops. Don't hesitate to contact us. That's it. Thank you for your watching this presentation and I'm looking forward to seeing you in Synops activities. That concludes our keynote presentations. I am now very excited to introduce our live panel and to get to your questions for them. So first, let me introduce who we have with us today on our panel. We have David Legler, who is the director of the Global Ocean Monitoring and Observing Program within NOAA, Eileen Tanshawai, who is a professor at the University of Sands Malaysia, Fraser Davidson is a research scientist and manager at Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Dr. Venkatasan is heading the Ocean Observation Systems Group at the National Institute of Ocean Technology in India, Peter Oki is a re research scientist at the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, Australia, a. Wu is an early career ocean professional and a senior lecturer at the Center for Marine and Coastal Studies, University Sands Malaysia. And Anyuate has also kindly agreed to join us back for our panel discussion as well. So let me come back here to look at the, some of the faces that we have. Um, we have several questions coming into our box and I'm going to start with, with one that has been waiting there for uh, a bit of time to be asked. Uh, how are we defining services? How do you define services? I have heard services defined everywhere from an FTP server to a data portal to a HAB forecast. So I, I imagine there could be a range of answers to that question, but I will pose that first to the panel. And I may call on people. Well, so if nobody wants to wants to start, I guess I can I can put in my two cents worth and let somebody else step in and correct me if you can hear me. So I guess um, I saw that question in the chat, and for me, um, ocean services are something. Um, well, I would regard them more as value-added products or information services that are supplied either publicly or to a, a targeted industry um, with the goal of informing decision making. And so, examples of a general product or a general. Um, ocean services and ocean forecast, a gridded product, and then for a sort of targeted um, service that might be a warning system for a, you know, for a particular coastal or, or open ocean industry. That's, I guess that was my reaction to that question. Thank you. I see Fraser, you have your hand up. I see Fraser.
and we can't hear you if you're talking. I know, David, you had your hand up at one point as well. Um, perhaps, yes. David, would you like to answer? Maybe Fraser will be able to jump in in a bit. Sure. Um, I, it's a great question. Um, I, I agree with Peter's view that, uh, to me, services, I think we're, we've matured to the point where services should be a product or a value-added uh, piece of information and knowledge that's actionable uh, by, by someone. And I hope we're beyond the point of FTP servers as are thinking about uh, what a service is, but there, there may be circumstances where in some locations where simple technologies might have to suffice. So, you know, we shouldn't necessarily exclude it, but I, I think, you know, sort of an application oriented perspective, I think is going to be useful. Thank you. Anya. Um, Fraser, have you managed to unmute yourself? No, not yet. Oh, how frustrating. Um, I was just going to contribute to what um, <clears throat> Peter and David said. Um, I think sometimes we know uh, an FTP server is often part of our infrastructure that we already have. And so um, that's something that's kind of funded by what we do. Um, I think sometimes services are actually be now the services that we're ex are expected from us. And then a lot of you aspirationally in these presentations, if we're really going by that, these are services that now need to be funded from the end user side or from someplace that's gonna actually build that connectivity from the FTC, FTP server and data portal to a dashboard for policymakers to um, outputs um, that can actually translate into action as David was saying. And I think the problem we have is that there that connectivity isn't quite there yet. We're used to delivering our data onto a data portal or, or an FTP server. And that's already sometimes for some groups, a lot of work um, given the funding that they have. Um, but to get from that to the real services that we're talking about in this conversation, a lot of which has been aspirationally put there by you know, these programs, we're gonna need work between the FTP server and something that's legible for um, a fisher, an indigenous person, um, a, a member of parliament and an environment minister. Uh, I think it's a whole new deal and it's a whole new challenge. So I'd be interested in whether people have thoughts about where we're gonna, how we're gonna manage this as a community. I think if not thoughts right at this moment, I am sure that that will be a continuing thread of this conversation as um, it's been clearly stated that you know, coordination and collaboration for impact is, is our challenge, right, for the ocean decade. Right, for the ocean um, decade. Um, There's a comment, uh, Jess, in, in the, uh, Fraser's unable to, to speak, but he's uh, put a comment in for the panelists. Uh, you, I don't know if you have access, you might just want to read that while, we're, while we wait for Fraser to come online. Thank you so much for pointing that out. I certainly will. Uh, so Fraser noted, service is a two is a two way relationship. An FTP server is a one way dialogue, but a service has support from knowledgeable people that can guide users if needed. Thank you for using the chat, and I hope you're able to unmute and, and speak firsthand. Uh, let me let me, if I may, move to the other question that's currently in our open Q and A. Um, Jay has asked, in the 4C presentation, there was no mention of standards or best practices for advancing modeling. So is, is there something to this? And is there something to address this? And how could that be done? Yeah, I can mention. Am I audible, Jesse? Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, fine. Yeah, the 4C is a transformative where uh, a, the, the product has to reach the end user. So definitely there is a importance of best practice and the standards to be followed that is being included in that. That is part of the whole exercise. Then only the, the product or the information what we provide is accurate enough. So this calls for uh, the best practice method. We also would like to have any of the end user who goes out to the field would like to the, uh, record their practices because the best practice is always a decision tree where you can change and it's adaptable. That is always, uh, we are looking forward to the 4C. Thank you. David, please. David, 
Um, I was just going to comment. I, I think that the, uh, the question touches upon, I think, an important point that um, having established standards and best practices is, uh, I think, one of the important indicators of a mature or maturing system. Uh, and and I think as we envision, you know, our maturity of particularly of beyond, you know, connecting observations to modeling to services, that having those standards best practices across that uh, suite of the value chain or across that value chain, I think, is something that we should aspire to. And you see that in the in the weather forecasting enterprise, where again there are standards and best practices, and that really, I think, enables and and uh, you know creates a um, uh, sets a bar for us to, you know, better standardize and democratize, if I can borrow that term from one of the slides, uh, some of our capabilities. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go to Peter and then Eileen. Yeah. yeah thanks. I, I guess just, I think it's a good question about um, ad, ad modeling standards. And it is something that if we don't pay attention to, we could get caught on. I have seen cases before where people have, uh, we, you know, consultants, for example, have employed intermediate models or uh, simplified models and then um, sort of tried to on-sell them to industry groups and they get information that way, but but not the best information. And so I do think this is quite an important thing for us to do. It might be that there are some groups that see this ocean decade as an opportunity to um, improve their own profile and, and they might not be using best practice tools. And so I think it is something we need to get onto early. I guess that's, that's the comment I wanted to make on. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jess. Um, I would like to add on um, um, the information on best practices. To me, is um, able to translate the data from a global scale to a local scale to be usable. And how do we connect the dots you know, from the information generated and translate it to a model? And the model can be implemented at the ground level. I think that is most important. If not, um, at the global level, we have lots of data, but uh, for, for especially for those underdeveloped countries who do not have a, a modeling system or, or observation system themselves, how can they best use all this global scale information for their, for their local use? Yeah, back to you, Jessica. I think so. That's an excellent point, and I was just um, I was just thinking about a few other questions that I have, as others may be thinking of their own to put into the Q and A or to the chat box. Um, so, so I think we've we've acknowledged that there needs to be this increased collaboration between modeling, the observation community, between um, not just that, but other end users and, and stakeholders from a, a wide range of resource levels. Um, how might these programs through the UN decade help to, to connect or, or make, make real progress in these areas. And it could be OBS to modeling, it could, it could be in, a, in a, different, um, a different part of the system, but how, how will the decade help to, um, to make progress? Peter. Well, I guess I have a response to that, but I hesitate to jump in first every time. So if other, if someone else on the panel wants to go for it, I, I'm happy to wait. Yeah. I suspect right now they'd be happy for you to continue and uh, and I'm sure they'll get their thoughts together. Well, okay, so I guess one of the things I think is an opportunity here is because of the profile of this program is for us to um, establish some new um, fora for collaboration between the OBS and the modeling community. You know, the, the modeling communities that I've been involved with, and I guess for me, you know, I guess I'm mostly involved with SYNOPS that Yusuki spoke about. This is a group of, of, um, of scientists who are empowered with, with excellent tools, who are ready to do something and to contribute and want to do something meaningful. And so we have sat together and we've identified questions that we think are relevant and we've tried to answer them using the tools that we have. But what's been missing there, I think, has, has been that um, the drive from the observational community. So I can imagine establishing some sort of interaction where we where the, the modelers, the data assimilation communities meet with the OBS folks. We identify the key questions that, that the observationalists want to answer. And then the modelers can figure out the best way to address those specific questions. Because with the, with the sort of work that Yusuki described under um, SYNOBS, 
it it really requires a specific question and if and the more specific the question is about what observing what observations do we need for this particular metric the more specific that is the the more accurate the or the more informative the experiments and the, the outcomes can be we can set up the experiments and run them for that question and then come back to the obs communities to test and to and refine so i think establishing that sort of meaningful collaboration where we might meet all together and then have a, a long period where we go away and do some work you know six months nine months or a year we can run our experiments analyze our results and then come back together again and then see how we went i think this would be could be a, would be a game changer for us thank you i'd like to go to venkatasan and then abe thank you i will add on to that there are two parts of uh, discussion here one is internal where you have the ocean community which is involved in the the observers and as well as we have the fo forecasters or modeling community that we, we discuss very clearly however when you talk about observation you go to the field it's becoming day by day very challenging ocean what we talk is so big and to be observed in the larger level to have a proper prediction here comes how do we share the, uh, the resources what we have so we need to look at in multi-institutional programs where we can interact and come to with it. There is also a possibility of sharing the resources among the UN community being a new UN, UN decade program. You can emphasize that ocean is oxygen like O2. You can have it uh, one ocean, one ocean of sport or O2 square, we can call that as a project, where you have the resources of different UN communities, where you have the different uh, observing platform or a ships or tools which need, which can collect and share the information. Today we have we are not able to cover the full aspect. There are limitations into that. However, there are many systems or many ships or many uh, the floating platforms are available. How best we can use and share the resources. Another aspect is affordable technology. When you talk about technology reaching the least developed countries or we talk about small island states, we need to look at how best the technology is affordable. There comes an opportunity which is a low hanging fruit like technical society encompassing its researchers, academicians, and uh, they have the presence all over the world. How do you motivate them? How do you bring them together? Because they have the mandate or technology to the benefit of the society. So ocean ops can get into them. Then the, this is a project ocean is one of the way where we can bring them together. And next 10 years, we can develop affordable technology so that today what we look at it, the ocean will be much more, much more different. Another aspect is deep ocean, which is still not known, unknown. It is so dark, even in dark in science, that need to be explored and expanded so that whatever product, whatever prediction we have, it will have a much better improvised version. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Jessica. I will just, I will just jump in. I, I think I have to echo what Peter and I can concentrate on collaboration. That's the key, uh, key word here for our, our program in the next uh, decade where um, modelers have been talking to modelers, observers have been talking to observers. So the biologists have been talking to the biologists only. Now it's an opportunity for us to unite, and sort of come out with a more, uh, you know, the, the environment of collaboration must be there uh, uh, in order for us to progress uh, in observing. Uh, that's why it's predicting how the ocean will behave in the next decade. That's point number one. I have another two more smaller points. Number two, I think it gives us opportunity for for infrastructure as well. As uh, the consensus said about um, smaller nations, the least developed nations, those are the nations that needed help and in order for us to progress uh, uh, as a global community in, in, in predicting uh, the ocean. So this, this has laid off the opportunity for you know, smaller countries and lesser fortunate countries to come to join the global community in predicting and, and looking at our ocean. That's number two and the third one, of course, as part of the young uh, professions, uh, um, uh, this definitely has provided an avenue to attract more of you know, younger people, you know, to be involved, to be interested, to you know, to build a career itself uh, uh, based on the ocean uh, for the next. I, I I don't see just the next decade; it will be 20, 30 years, uh, even 50 years ahead, which is very, very important to um, uh, uh, to the global community. That's all from me, Jessica. Thanks. Excellent points. Thank you, Abe. Eileen, please. Eileen, I see your hand up. If you can hear me um, and you have a comment, please feel free to unmute yourself. 
Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, I, I echo what Abby and, and uh, Ben Ferguson has mentioned. Um, uh, or besides the collaboration, I think uh, we still need to look at the right set of institutions and networking uh, to allow to build a strong innovative capability in ocean observation. When I mention innovative capability is because based on the different uh, 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 support, funding in terms of funding support, technology support, if we, the, the countries with different degree of, of uh, uh, exposure or, 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 or innovation uh, or, or support in terms of technology, they have to be more innovative uh, rather than adopting what the, the developed country has and, and trying to do it in their country is most probably is not possible. They need to innovate and change it and adapt it to the local scenario so they can also contribute to uh, uh, giving contributing data to the ocean observation. Yeah, back to you, uh, uh, Jess, thanks. Excellent point. And uh, that certainly is something that stuck with me from, um, from the core event yesterday, talking about, um, about co-development and sharing, um, two-way learning, um, co-sharing of information um, and co-development, co, -development, co um, um, the word is now escaping me, but absolutely that, that uh, it's not, it's not a, a, by any means a one directional thing does not work. And so your, your point is very well made. Um, I would like to, to pose a new Question. Actually, let me pause for one second and see if Fraser, if you're able to speak or if you have your hand up for a comment to, to share right now. Co-design, thank you, is the word I was looking for. Um, sure, uh, can you hear me now? I can, we can, please, the floor is yours. Okay, that's my work computer, it has me locked down, so I use my personal computer uh, for certain things. Um, so what, what the decade brings is it puts all these players at the table or interacting with each other throughout the full value chain. The big gap that we're filling or that I see that will happen in the decade is really federating the uh, what I'll call operational oceanography, but it can also be uh, the value chain. It can also be uh, called the ocean observing value chain, but it's going all the way from observations to end use and having that work synergistically together. If we look at the weather, uh, like the WMO, they already have a structure in place, which they call the Global Data uh, Processing and Forecasting System. And uh, others, uh, they have a suite of uh, frameworks and so on, so that all the contributing countries, even though there's not one super group uh, with, with everybody together, but all contributing countries, uh, provide forecasts and they all act as if it came from one body. And that's because they follow uh, standards and best practices and so on, and there's forums to exchange. And this, uh, uh, this sort of approach, uh, we have to do that for the ocean in our own oceanic way. But we have extremely good fundamental elements. We've got good observing programs. We've got good modeling. We've got good industry for end users, met ocean industry, et cetera. But what we're not... Uh, uh, what, what's missing is kind of this framework to pull all that together so it can act as one, so that uh, input, say, from a small player or from a small observing system, uh, then can be used broadly across the globe by uh, all different nations, et cetera, and then come back in uh, value-added end use for someone next to that observation, et cetera. So it's really where even a small contribution can have a big impact because everybody is sharing and uh, everybody's interdependent and uh, federated uh, in this, what I'll call operational oceanography family, but it's uh, really sort of that um, uh, full value chain or that uh, full ecosystem uh, of producing ocean information. And that two way, uh, and I think everything the other uh, speakers have mentioned kind of uh, fits in that or uh, I, I'm uh, quite supportive of what everyone else has said. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you. Venkat, I see your hand. Thank you. I will add to what you said. It's a very interesting point when you mentioned since I'm involved in WMO where the earth system approach is really picking up where the ocean has got a larger role to play 
Japan, there will be a, a newer program called GBON, it's a Global Basic Observing Network, and there will be GBON oceans will be there soon to come. I'm sure that where we all can contribute and develop this as a for NWP applications. So that's a good point, what he writes. There is already a synergy has been built in and larger activity, the nations are working together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, oh, I saw that. There it is. Another question in the Q&A. Um, nowadays, we have various reanalysis systems available for the same region, such as the Atlantic Ocean. Can we provide a tool for the end users that would facilitate the intercomparison of these products? Was it, isn't the answer kind of yes, but we still have yet to do it. <laughs> so I, this is David. So Jess, I would just say that um, the answer is yes. And uh, there was mention in some of the uh, descriptions that we heard uh, this evening, this morning about um, innovations and in, in, uh, digital technologies, digital oceans. Uh, I can imagine a whole revolution in how information is provided and how we interact with information. So, um, Yes, I think the answer is yes. We're just not quite there yet. And I think um, we also heard, you know, one. I think one of the possible pathways is we've heard throughout the, the session that there are some examples, exemplars, test cases, however you want to pose them, some issues or topics around which that we might be really ready to make some progress. And maybe those are some good examples where we can uh, work collaboratively to collectively to, you know, provide and fill in all those gaps that, that Fraser and others have been talking about uh, to help provide those services and address those end user needs. Anya, please. Yeah, just briefly, um, I, I totally am with, um, with David on this one. I think we not only can we do it, but we know we have the technology, we know what to do. It's a question of, galvanizing concerted action, getting a call to action that can be effective across our very, very splintered and siloed community, and also finding a place where that action can be supported by nations or by other organizations. And I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, we know what to do. And, and I think that's the message we need to take to policymakers, foundations, and other um, potential supporters is that we're not a we're not a community that's dithering and sitting around um, worrying about you know what wh what the next problem is. We know what our we 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 know what the key problems are. We know the climate change is occurring. We know the huge issues in the ocean, but we're 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 still a little bit disengaged from the community that's going to invest in these solutions. So. To me, part of this ocean decade thing is, is, is matching up our ambition and the fact that the scientific community is technically empowered. So time to act. Um, and so the, 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 the ocean decade for me is about, let's find that mechanism for action. Let, let's make this happen. Um, easier said than done, right? Uh, and uh, as one who's trying to do it, I, 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 I don't think it's an easy uh, step, but, but it's absolutely critical. Thank you, Anya. And Fraser, is your hand back up? I just, I want to make sure I'm calling on you if appropriate. Uh, yes, it's back up. Please then, please, by all means. Uh, so, um, I, I mean, I think the decade will enable this digital platform approach. And the platform approach is we've been going more towards, uh, or in the past, it's been more, here's a publication, here's a paper, or here's a chart. And the platform is really allows the user or anybody, whether it's a very educated scientist or a, a fisherman, uh, uh, they can access a platform and really have the full power of these supercomputing output, I say from uh, prediction centers, really at the fingertips in the manner that they need, right? And uh, I think what's going to happen over this decade is that we'll uh, really be able to uh, I'll, I'll say enable fishermen to sort of benefit from this uh, uh, every scientist and so on working on prediction 
have all of that knowledge really at their fingertips. They don't need to understand the equations, et cetera. They just know that the information that they'll get will allow them to do their job safer, better, faster, et cetera. And there's elements of this platform approach already in place or uh, et cetera, but you know, we haven't grown that uh, uh, as a community together. And so in the data simulation world, there's like a Jedi platform that allows, it's not Star Wars, but it's a basically prepackaged or, or an environment in which it's easy to be a modeler and add data simulation to it or have data simulation and take someone's model and uh, approach things to do uh, assessment of uh, ocean conditions. And in the user side, uh, the same thing, you could do it by iPhone, et cetera. But the idea is to build uh, with standards and best practices uh, uh, and work with the IT world or the software developer world. There's a lot that they can uh, uh, they can do. Just think of Google Earth and now look at that as sort of Google oceanography, uh, but with all the forecast information. There. Thank you. I'd like to go to Peter and then Anya. Yeah, I guess I had uh, two comments to make in response to that. One was, I guess, maybe obvious, but I think we do need to entrain a different, um, a different set of skills in a different community to help us to do this, this delivery. Because I think if we try to do it, we'll, we'll come up with a way to deliver, you know, forecasts and reanalyses to the community, but it, there might be a slicker way that we, that others who are perhaps more tech savvy can can deliver. So I think we need to keep that in mind. But one comment that I, one thing I was, I guess I was thinking about when I was watching the keynote speakers and through this discussion is just around the quality assurance of the products and services that we provide. Uh, having dipped my toe into the observational community, it's clear that one of the, pri the primary um, concerns they have is around um, indicating the quality can, the quality of, of the observations they provide. And so for most communities, they provide quality control flags and this is done very rigorously. And so it means the user can access that data confidently knowing whether there's gross errors or whatever, what, what's, what the confidence we, we can have in that. And there's no such thing for ocean forecasts and for ocean services. And I think this is a gap. And so I can imagine us as coming up with a way of establishing some sort of quality indicator, and it could be by region or, or variable, and um, it could be made public in it, and it could actually serve three purposes. It could inform a user of the quality of the products of the data that they're accessing. It could inform the modelers about where they need to put their attention, where things are poor, and it could inform the observational community to identify where there are data gaps and so it, it could be something that all three of these kind of entities that we're talking about here can can have a focal point. I don't know how to do that, but I think it's something that we might we might aspire to. Thanks. Thank you, Anya. Take Peter's point. Um, you know, really well, obviously, on the technological side. I guess for me, and this speaks a little bit to Jay's uh, next question about building trust and prediction on lay, from lay people. To me, the conversation has to be, of course, with the technology um, providers. That's obviously critical. But what I'm finding personally, the tricky questions are talking with the lay community. So I, I, I bet it was approached a little while ago by um, fishers in, North, in Southwestern Nova Scotia saying, we want a bunch of that data you guys have. And I'm like, what does data mean to a uh, lobster fisherman? What, what do you need from us? I mean, they're way more wealthy in some ways than we are. Lobster fisherman is a, very, is a million dollar enterprise, right? So what does, what does data that we have mean to that person and how would we deliver it to them in a way that they can digest it and use it? I immediately realized that conversation is, is just in its infancy. Um, and then also <clears throat> talking to the private sector, there's a number of, um, there's a lot of new cheap technologies out there and <clears throat> a number of startups, for example, with new gizmos that they're throwing in the water um, are asking questions like, what do people need? Because I can put a temperature sensor on my, on my float. Can I monetize that? Who's going to pay me for that? What, how, how will that bring a value added? So there's a whole set of new conversations going on that, that I'm having. I'm not saying that I'm necessarily having them at a very 
shall we say, advanced level, right? Because I'm just trying to understand. But I think those are sometimes more challenging because very often in these kind of conversations, we're often talking to ourselves. And I mean, I don't think there's probably anyone on this call who doesn't see two or three people that they've spoken to in the last year on a, on a, on a similar topic, right? What we, in, in, in a way, we need to be jumping off this train and jumping into that conversation with communities, fishers, small um, tech, tech startups, and, and figuring out where the ocean, because that's where the ocean dashboard and the delivery, that's where the, the definition of service is going to end up being defined. I'll leave it there. Thank you. I've raised a few other questions in my mind, but first let me go to, um, to Fraser and then Peter and Venkat. Oh, sorry, this time my hand was up, uh, still up. I didn't bring it down, sorry. Just keeping me on my toes, that's great. Um, Peter, that everybody's hands has disappeared. Me too, I just forgot to put it down, sorry. <laughs> Venkat, please. Yeah, I'll add to Anya. This is a very important point, what she touched upon, because uh, the, the linking between fisheries and uh, ocean science and oceanographic prediction is very important, which we are always talking to the oceanographers. So there's one point which we need to take up the observation point of it. You have a broad set of data sets, which the modelers would be using it. Can we define it to three broader category, very high resolution for the calibration validation exercise. You have the medium category, which can be used currently by the ocean science for the forecasting community. There could be smaller level, which like these startups or anybody else or the fishing community provide us some information, which will add on value to it. What is it? What is the, the, the user, particularly user I'm talking about the modelers. What do they want? Will they be able to use that? Will that encompass into that? So we can divide this uh, data into this type of category. Of course, from that, it comes to quality control and uh, much more on that. So this is the next way to look. And third could be on the, the, uh, the area where you are looking for it. You want some more sensitive area, which is must, and that could be some broader area, which is required to support. So this is the way, like you you know, this uh, the biodiversity community have divided into marine product areas, sensitive areas. So there could be a larger level to look at it. There we need the data. Even the resolution of the data sets are good, but we need to improvise a model. This has to come from the modelers to the observation community. This is what internal discussions look at. I support Anya's view. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, please. Mm, I think I think this was also um, one of the biggest questions also for from the last session. And how do we actually translate now? And now data observing has, has reached a point of maturity where, you know, I, I mean, I, I can't say that we have done enough. We will never be enough, but um, the accumulation of metadata now is, is massive. And then I think, um, how does that make sense to the, the, the end users as we are talking about services? How does the fishermen in the coastal area of Fiji, for example, are going to benefit from what the observing is going to do. So now I think this kind of program, which is which is now providing the opportunity, how do we then translate metadata at the end of the day to, to be something that is useful and it, some of one of the models uh, that we produce or prediction that we, we produce and by using such platform for what we are going to do for the next 10 years is to then translate it something that is understandable um, and it's simple enough for, for even a fisherman from, from the most remote area could benefit from it. And, and as I see from the Q&A, there is also a question that, that talks about how do then we build trust um, um, for, for, for this um, community to sort of really get involved with science itself. They, they may not be able to understand, but they are the, they are the people who is gonna be impacted and they are the, actually the biggest user of our data and our prediction. So, this sort of program that we, I think we envision to solve in the next uh, decade. And how do we then bring uh, jargons uh, to, to, to the people at the end of the day? So I think that, that, that is what um, drives us uh, um, in, in, in proposing such big scale program globally. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Eileen. Yeah, thank you. I uh, just, just throwing out um, a suggestion, you know, um, uh, talking about translate, translating the data to be usable. Uh, I guess 
you know we are talking about integrated and, and multidisciplinary so maybe it's time to bring in you know besides the modelers it's time to bring in the economists that can actually translate the data into dollar and cents that would be more interesting for the stakeholders or the or the industry people um, to, to understand and to capture and, and it will be uh, when it's converted to dollar and cents it will be more meaningful uh, for the stakeholders and the industry or the private sector to use the ocean data. Yeah, thank you. Back to you, uh, Jess. Thank you. Anya, please. Yeah, I was just going to respond to that, um, Aileen. Good, good point. And actually, what we've been trying to do is um, work with the Economist Research Intelligence Unit to on a, on a program for evaluating, for value-aiding um, the, the, uh, the value of ocean data to GDP. And this hasn't, it, there's also been some amazing work that Emma Haslop has been involved in um, with the OECD. So, so there are a couple of places where that conversation is now uh, being pushed forward. It's not particularly easy because as soon as you get into econometrics, I mean, believe me, I don't, you know, I don't pretend to understand it all, but, um, you know, I'm, we're trying. Um, and so, yes, that's, that's beginning, I think, to happen. Um, and uh, that's going to take again. Uh, that'll be a tr tr if that continues, it'll it'll be a transformative outcome of the decade. But it's it's almost like translating across languages, right? It's it's um, when you go from let alone observing to prediction, prediction to delivery, data management, all those things that are already really complex and difficult about ocean observing. When you go down to the when you then you reach out to economists and fishers and small businesses, it starts to uh, multiply. And I think it means also training a new generation of communicators across that space. Um, so we need to be, the new grad students need to be nimble in those languages. Um, so not, it's not like we don't have enough to do. <laughs> Thank you, Anya. And I'm, I'm going to use um, a bit of moderator's privilege before I go into the Q&A for other um, questions. So bear with me for just a minute. But I think this is a, a good moment to um, to talk about how how we do just that, Anya, right? There's there's uh, a need to, uh, we all in some ways know how to talk to one another. We've been talking to each other a lot. We all recognize there are lots of other communities that we should be talking to and how do we talk to them? And one in particular, I think the decade is, is doing a, a pretty decent job at is reaching out to the early career ocean professionals. And since we have one on our panel, um, Ava would like to, to point to you and, and then obviously welcome others to, to contribute. How do we, um, um, you know, for example, Yusaki pointed, he invited everybody, early career professionals, please come to the table. How do we engage more early career ocean professionals and, and others in the conversation? What's an effective way to do that so that we're, we're building a new community? It's, <laughs> this is quite difficult, I think, uh, even, even to, for me to, to represent the young community. I think one of the, one of the challenges in, in, in our community, in younger people, is that how do they feel or how do they look at the ocean impacting them and i think one of the things is that probably to younger generation uh, i am still unable to grasp that the ocean actually um, is is the one single entity that is going to uh, not just impact their livelihood it's going to impact the way of life in the next more challenging 50 years it's, it's, it's going to change how we look at life itself so by realizing that um, you know putting more uh, emphasis on, on, on looking at, and not just, I mean, I mean, probably the younger generation probably would just want to look at how, how it can develop their career and sort of things like that. But I think we have to move beyond uh, the narrative of, 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 of just uh, using it as a career or a job, you know, trying to look at how does our efforts um, and, and can impact not just themselves, but also impacts community, which is the less, uh, which is more needed of, of help. So I think by that narrative, probably we can um, gain more um, support, gain more, uh, um, uh, uh, what you call, interest uh, from, from the younger people. That's number one. And number two, a very short point is that I think continuing to reach out um, to the people, to, 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 to young people, to continue to, to, to engage in talks with them is one essential way of, doing by by just inviting i think we have to move beyond that as well you know trying to explain what are we trying to achieve here you know it's not just simple as come in to talk about it and then tomorrow we forget about it but 
you know, sorting, putting a point that we are going to impact the ocean and the world in a very substantial way by doing having this kind of collaborative uh, collaboration work across the globe. Thanks, Jessica. And thank you for humoring that question. That's that's quite a large one to place on one person's shoulders. But um, I appreciate you you. Uh, you uh, speaking up on behalf of the other early career ocean professionals. So let me go back to the list of questions in the Q&A. Uh, there is one that asks, does the ocean observing and modeling community at present have a consolidated or endorsed shortlist of best practices and standards? OBPS is great, but it can be overwhelming to go through. And OBPS, I'm not positive if that is ocean best practices site. I'm not quite familiar with that acronym. Perhaps others on this call are. Ocean best practices system. Yeah. System, I was close with the S. Yes. Well, I guess I can speak to that, speak um, to that. having been involved with it. Unless Jay, Jay Perlman, I believe he's here, he might want to speak up to speak to it too. I don't know if he's has access to his uh, um, I don't want to speak for Jay, but you know the ocean best practice system is is in, in you know a great start. It's a place where people are logging their methods and their methodologies. It's a great beginning of the conversation, and the community then has to graduate itself to finding mechanisms of consolidating and endorsing best practices so that it isn't overwhelming. Um, it'll probably always have a bit of an overwhelming asset, but that would be the next ambition, I think. And I don't know whether uh, Jay wants to either speak up or, or, or write us a, I hope I haven't misrepresented what he would say. Yes, we can allow Jay to speak if he would like to. So Jay, if, if you would like to, we can unmute you to the, um, provide an answer as well. Uh, thank you very much, Jess, and thank you, Anya. Um, this is a significant problem. When we started out looking at the EOVs and in GUs, there were multiple best practices related to EOVs and somebody starting wouldn't know which one to pick. And so over time, we've recognized that there is a need for endorsed best practices. And I have to give credit to um, Juliet Hermes and um, also the group at Goose that you're listening to now, um, particularly Emma, uh, in that we've started a process to endorse practices. And that has to be done through the community, not through the ocean best practice system. That's not the role there. And so this is a good case where if the ocean predict, and in fact, of course, the 4C wanted to engage in being a panel for identifying, endorsing best practices, that would be a major step forward. Thank you, Jay. Venkat, would you like to add? Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I had the uh, pleasure of having, uh, working with Jay and we have few publication and last year and the regional level we had presented and one of the important as aspect of uh, best practice is uh, data interoperability. This is what we are looking at. You collect the data for a particular cause for a physical oceanographic studies. Can this be used for other applications? And the best practice for the particularly for earlier career uh, professionals, you can look at in the IOD site. Many of the best practices are documented and placed there. I'd also mention about uh, the decision tree. The best practice is uh, so much adaptable that you come out with a new best practice, which is much more than whatever you do it that can be brought in and adapted by others. So the, what we are talking in the best practice is trying to document and the knowledge what you have to be shared with others. I hope uh, Jay will agree and I do justice to whatever he has been propagating it. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I'll, I will note that uh, the link to the, the Ocean Best Practices site was just dropped into the chat as well if you'd like to go take a look. Fraser. I just wanted to say that uh, I hear uh, Jay Perlman when he said, uh, uh, yeah, for Ocean Predict or for c to uh, uh, help with their expertise in validating or approving uh, things. Uh, I think that's a very good suggestion. I will bring that uh, forward and it will be discussed. Uh, we have a meeting tomorrow, so it'll be discussed there too. Uh, thank you, Jay. Thank you all. I'd like to go on to the next question in our Q&A. 
Does GOOS and the associated programs have a timeline for how the regional gaps in knowledge will be filled in? David, please. Um, I, boy, I wish we did. <laughs> um, I think we'd like to have that timeline be as 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 soon and and, and as as uh, <laughs> promptly as possible. But I think the realities are that um, you know, that's uh, a little unclear at the moment. I think we know where many of these regional gaps at at, at sort of regional scale. You can think of it as uh, sometimes in depth or in scope of EOVs, uh, even. Um, down at the local level. So there are a number of needs. Um, I, I, boy, I wish I had a good answer to that question. I don't think I have one though, sorry. Just acknowledging it's a great question. The short answer might be we have a decade. Yeah. Well, and, and, and you know, kind of going back to Anya's point about, um, you know, there are uh, interested investors and, and agencies who with, um, I think the, kind of compelling arguments that we're making raising here and another four are surrounding the UN decade. Um, I, I, it would be my hope that we could hasten that timeline, whatever, whatever that might be. So Eileen, please. I was about to suggest that even for the decade itself or for any networks, um, you know, we, the decade sounds a long time, 10 years, but it's actually very fast and, and it's not that long uh, in actual fact. It would be good to have a roadmap, you know, uh, after certain years, what are the measurables and how do we quantify the achievement over, over the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, without even for networks, you know, like Goose or Coast Predict, it would be good to have um, uh, a roadmap um, uh, working along the decade. So you, at least we know the directions rather than um, business as usual. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Great question and great suggestions. And um, all of this is being captured. It's part of now the, the, the data collection that we're doing around the decade. So hopefully we will be able to, um, as a, a community, make progress. I'd like to move on to another question in our Q&A. If one facilitates resource exploitation, should you also bring in the regulators? Fraser. I think the trick here is uh, to make the information available to everybody, the people who are exploiting things, the people who may have be impacted by, uh, by, by the exploitation, as well as the regulators. And everybody has access to the same, I'll say computing platform ecosystem where they can all get the same information. And interacting say within the, with the oil industry, say in Newfoundland, a big thing that they sort of said is, we want to be environmentally responsible, but like you can't take a, uh, like a broad decision without any data to support it to say, uh, oh, we need to be absolutely precautionary, but uh, um, you, you know, there's no physics related to it or there's not, no sort of evidence that, uh, that shows things, we're just being precautionary. So the more evidence we can bring and the more information and this is what will happen or this is likely what will happen, but be able to demonstrate it, then that'll be good. Uh, everybody's on the same footing, whether they're impacted or whether the exploitation of a resource person or whether they're a regulator, they all have the same information. So they're all discussing and arguing on something that's as real as possible, as opposed to, um, uh, yeah, uh, as opposed to not, not well informed or not necessarily real or uh, a big deal about nothing, or maybe they're making no deal about something that's really important to make a deal. Thank you. Thank you, please. I think he has uh, given a very, very valid and correct answer why we need to share the data. And uh, here comes uh, the importance here, which again, I'm quoting the WMO, where they're talking about uh, the open data source. Even in the ocean community, there is an open GTS has been propagated by NOAA. You know very well GTS is a global telecom uh, telecommunication system by which uh, the data sets are automatically transferred for the prediction. Many of you are using it. However, when you make open GTS, these 
uh, questions or the doubts or the information what is required is available. I think that's a valid point why we need to propagate the idea of sharing the data. I think I really support this point. Thank you. Uh, we are at quarter of the top of the hour. I'd like to, let's see, I think there's a pause in new questions coming into our Q&A for the moment. I, I'd like to ask, I don't know if this will be controversial or not, perhaps provocative. Um, there's certainly um, recognition that resources are, are limited and limiting. Um, there, you know, Anya spoke about the need for and, and how hard it is to break into new um, new sources to, to quite frankly fund some of the work that we know we need to do. So do, do people have any thoughts on, uh, on ways we may be able to do that through the decade? And the flip side of that is if we're not able to, to secure significant new resources um, during the UN decade, what, what would the decade look like without that? What could we still do uh, and, and achieve? Frazier, please. Uh, so I, I'll try and get both parts to the, to the question, but the first one, as far as new resources, I mean, one sort of area of untapped uh, thing is looking at a two-way relationship. Uh, and I'll take the e-navigation that's sort of up and emerging as an example. And there you have the hydrographic uh, organizations of the world are taking the ocean prediction systems and the packaging goes up into tiles so it's easy to send to your phone or easy to send to uh, 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 across the high seas and so on to a ship uh, their ectus or their navigation system and uh, you know they'll have a subscription probably where they're paying for uh, to, to get this service uh, just like you would pay for high level map information that you're getting in real time on traffic or something to route your trucks through a big town of New York or something. And uh, so you'll have the same kind of service in e-navigation. And these ships are also collecting a lot of information themselves. They may have uh, intake uh, temperature on their, um, uh, on the, for their cooling system uh, on the water. They may have uh, meteorological instrumentation. Uh, they may have instrumentation that scientists uh, put, put, put in there, uh, like a uh, flow through uh, meters and things like that. And that, if that information is shared back, they may get a discount. So it's looking at uh, trying to make a two-way relationship where the business is kind of built in that uh, if they share their information, the forecast would be better. Uh, on their boat and that we can demonstrate that it would be better uh, on their boat. So putting that two-way relationship makes it uh, easy for smaller groups to contribute, uh, uh, whether it's their own, uh, they buy their own boys to put them out and so on because they know there's a benefit uh, in, in the forecast uh, uh, when they go out or they, they have an activity to do. And then, uh, yeah, and then I forget now the second part of the question, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not at all. What what if what if there are no new resources? What can the decade still bring to bear? Well, okay, that's a good point. So even without resources, I think it's uh, um, you know it's the collaboration, it's the exposure of different groups, and uh, figuring out how to work together better. And there's value in uh, working better together or having a framework to better uh, work better together. Uh, there's efficiency. That efficiency is like new funding because you're not wasting time putting observations here or there because the modelers are telling you, okay. So uh, basically, it's um, if there's no new resources, we will get better coordination, better bang for our buck. That is what I would put it at. Thank you. Ben Cat. Yeah, I add to this point, and uh, there are like uh, CBA 2030, what you mentioned about is uh, one of the major activity which is going to happen now, the other funding is there. Can we join with them so that uh, the data sets what we collect on the, the KWS automatic weather station or the CSFS temperature, what they collect could be shared. Next could be on the, the case of uh, fishing boats where the fishing vessels go and sail out and the, the FAO has got uh, the best practice manual, uh, they call it uh, where the fishermen, they use it. Can we, can we uh, promote them as a UNDG to collect very simple data like pressure, temperature, and the SST alone, and that can be shared. And we also can do the forecast to them. Currently, they... That is one way we can do that. 
Uh, another one is about the current, if you don't have that kind of question could be, we are heading towards newer uh, tools like AI and ML. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of youngsters looking into that using the current data, using AI and ML for a prediction. I'm sure that that will pay way for a newer understanding and uh, is serving to the society. Thank you. Thank you. David. Um, so yeah, thanks, Jess. I was, um, I think that with regards to new resources, um, I'm very optimistic that new resources will come to the table. Um, my question is, you know, how long will it take to kind of get that? And I think the kind of interactions that Anya pointed to earlier are indications uh, we have we have needs that we have to respond to as a community. Um, and I would just point to one example of small signs that there, there are increasing interest in the oceans and this kind of work about around surrounding co-design. Um, over the last uh, two years or so, the WMO has developed a, a new strategic plan and embraces Earth system prediction. And as part of that, just recently in the last year or so, they, they are devoting more time and attention than actual WMO dollars uh, towards um, staff support for the ocean observing enterprise and tracking observations, uh, assisting how that metadata and stuff get into their systems. And I think that's a strong indication of the type of um, uh, interest we're going to see. I think it's gonna take a little bit for us to, to, to you know, get, get a reaction and get some investment, but I, I'm pretty confident it will happen. In the situation where there is no new funding, I still think there are lots of things we can do, and we 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 will do. Um, we are we do have a, 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 a abundance of observations. They need to be better integrated of what we have. We need to help, and we need more co-development as part of that. We've seen examples over the last several years of co-development efforts, for example, in the Tropical Pacific, where Yosuke was even talking about. The modelers came to the table and helped inform uh, what the new design for that tropical Pacific observing system is. And so I think these types of activities will, will happen regardless. Even if there's no new monies, uh, we will still have some, some level of activity in the space. Thanks. Well, I think that's a, a perhaps a, a wonderful positive uh, note to, to wrap up the Q&A section of the panel. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists, and I'd like to to give each one of them a moment to um, to provide any closing or final remarks, things that jumped out at them or that they'd like to share. And so, feel free to put your hand up um, as as things come to you. Um, any closing remarks you have, Anya, please. First of all, just thanks um, for this opportunity in this conversation. <clears throat> and I, I sort of agree and disagree with um, Venkat and David. I I am. Um, I think that if we don't have any funding investment, any real substantial funding investment, we'll continue as we are now. And this conversation has been really great. So there's obviously conversations we can have that are gonna be helpful, supportive, bring our community together and do lots of useful things. I don't think that we, I would like to send a message to the decade organizers that that's not good enough. Because my concern here is that we've got observations that through COVID have been declining. We know we've had, um, you know, reduction in, in our observations. We know that we urgently be need better resolution for some of the temperature and, and uh, carbon and other signatures that are telling us more about climate change trajectories. And I, I just feel that the case is so overwhelming that we as a community we have an opportunity in the decade to step up and say it's urgent that we need to keep because we'll, otherwise the, the 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 observing systems will gently decline as the observations for example in the north in north atlantic over the last five to ten years have gently declined and and that means that all this lovely aspirational work that we want to do in terms of delivering to end users which is going to take effort and, and work will will be less easy to do because we won't have that kind of uh, you know the the, the top level of uh, so i just I, I agree, we will have fabulous conversations regardless of that investment. And, and, and there's so many great brains and, and thoughtful, you know, generous people, but this is volunteerism. 
And there's a lot of people who are working really long hours and not getting paid for it and need those, those assistants and the, the, the extra scientists and their teams to, to make this all happen. So I would hope that we send a message to the, to, the, to the UN decade organizers that we urgently need more funding and that it is part of their role to help match us up with some of these big international philanthropists so that we can get that happening. There are big groups looking to invest let's match us up. And, and uh, that doesn't mean we're not going to do fabulous things without it because we have already. That's what we've been doing so far. That's the UN decade so far, uh, totally unfunded. And look at us, right? Um, so, uh, but, but, but I think we should ask for more. And, and, uh, and again, thank you so much, Jessica and, uh, and Christine and, and the whole organizers for today's event. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Ben Kat, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. Thank you, and Christine. And uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity. It has been a very wonderful. What I want to say, the positive note is that the activity what you are doing now, you and Decade, has really opened up uh, the policy makers to think about sustainable ocean policies. If that comes through, maybe I'm sure there's with a positive note, the COVID uh, will ease out and there could be more opportunity for them to think at, think at it. And they know very well now, it's all the awareness is brought in to all level that ocean is too big, ocean is too central, ocean is very much required, ocean need to be observed, that is for the future. I think this message would be conveyed. Let us wait for the good thing to happen from the policymaker side to support each and every one of us. Thank you. Thank you. Peter. Yeah, thanks. I, I guess also I would like to thank you for the opportunity to participate in this meeting. It has been very interesting and informative and I've, I've enjoyed it very much. And I guess just uh, one of the things I'm taking away from this is, is just about the opportunities for collaboration that this, that this big activity op offers for us. And, uh, and I guess it's more of a comment around at the grassroots level where I think we need to encourage those, of, those people in our communities to to not be afraid to jump over the fence and to talk to the other groups that they would like to talk to, but but haven't. Uh, you know, sometimes we want to wait to engage with those groups until we've really got something to say. And I think that we needn't wait for that. I think just joining, you know, Yusuke offered everybody, whoever wants to come to his meetings should come. And I guess I would encourage people just to do that and just to try it. And, and there's a flip side to that for those groups that, that get stuck on technical things, they might need to be a bit more sensitive to that. And, um, and think about those people who are participating and target to them so that it can be a meaningful exchange. So um, I'm really excited about the opportunities. And it's ironically with COVID and it's all sitting on Zoom too much, it actually provides us an opportunity to do that without spending too much time sitting on planes. So maybe there's a win there. Thanks again for having me. Thank you. There's definitely some carbon footprint impact there. I have David, then Fraser, and Eileen. Thanks, Jess. And I, I too want to add my my thanks to you, Jess, for moderating, to Anne for all the behind the scenes organizing coordination, and to the to the my fellow panelists. I came away. Um, um, there was a comment earlier, and I can't remember who who spoke, who spoke but it, it's it's similar to what Peter said. It the about uh, building this collaborative environment and the complexities and nuances and the relationships we build through that environment, I think are critical to the vitality of the enterprises that we've been active in, but also more importantly, I think going back to what the, Anya was speaking to at the beginning, being better able to an provide answers and knowledge to people who need it most. And so the fact that we're having this conversation is really exciting. And I think the UN decade has just fostered a great dialogue here. So I'm really appreciative of the opportunity to, to share views and thoughts. And I really am excited about the openness and open invitations that we're extending already to be part of that. So I think it's terrific. Thank you. Thank you. With one minute left, Fraser, then Eileen. Yeah, I'll be brief. I think the decade will allow uh, us to break down silos, to work together and democratize uh, information flow. I also think that uh, if you look, the new trend is what they call impact forecasting. It's not just here's the forecast or here's what's happening. Here's what it means to you. And I think that'll help also with the funding. If we say, here's what the, your dollars mean as far as a better forecast or the safety of a coastal town, uh, et cetera, uh, that will help quite a bit. Uh, back to you. Thank you. Eileen, please. Thank you, Jess. Um, 
I would like to, a short one from me, I would like to also emphasize the needs to look into urban ocean that has been presented by Nadia on, on post predict where people live and then also into uh, looking into the causes that actually impact the ocean, uh, trying to uh, address the, the answers, you know, uh, to the changes in the ocean data. And, and also to echo what Anna has said and, and, uh, and the rest has mentioned, um, I think all of us, you know, we should keep on doing what we are doing and keep ensuring what we are doing to be referred and to be relevant to the society and, and all stakeholders. Thank you. Back to you, uh, Jess. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, um, my, my brief concluding thanks remarks to our, our panelists, to all of you attendees who have, have stuck with us virtually um, for these two hours. I um, have thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks to Anne again for her work in organizing it. And a reminder to everyone that this was recorded. Uh, it will be posted on the GOOS website along with the presentations. And so please, if you need to reference anything or, or to share it forward with others who weren't able to attend, I encourage you to do so. Thank you. I certainly am feeling um, positive and energized about the decade, and I look forward to working with um, hopefully many of you in the in the future. Thank you again for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Just